Welcome everyone. We'll have a talk by Alexander Stephen about writing, uh, testing C code with uh, Python. Please welcome Alexander. Hello everyone. Thanks for joining the session. Um, I work as an embedded software developer, so I write firmware for microcontrollers mostly. Unfortunately, this is mostly C code, not yet Python code. Though recently we've ported MicroPython to one of our controllers, so somehow we're getting better. Um, before I start with the talk, I'd like to know a bit more about you and your experiences with unit tests. So if you've written any unit test in any language yet, please raise your hand, so get an overview. Okay, great, that's most of you. Um, and who of you has written unit tests for C code? Probably in C then. Okay, that's probably about half of you. And uh, last question then is who enjoyed the experience, especially if you compare it to writing Python code instead? Well, a single guy, yeah, perfect. <laughs> so then maybe I can show you a, a more fun way to write unit tests for C code. Um, now you might wonder uh, what my motivation is for that, and some of it can probably be summed up with this quote here, that the C language combines all the power of assembly language with all the ease of use of assembly language. So with C, you've got control over everything, and you can control everything, but you usually also have to control everything. You need to do everything for yourself. There's little support from the language, and uh, for the testing stuff, you probably don't need all this power. You're not constrained with resources. You don't have that performance requirements uh, that you might have in, produc in production code. So you could actually use a higher level language to make it easier for you to write your test code. Um, don't do everything in a low level language like C. Now let's look into that in a bit more detail. If you write unit tests for C code with C code, then there are some good things. You've got the same language everywhere. So as a developer, you do not need to switch context between different languages, different styles, different syntax. And it might also be good for a lazy developer who only knows a single language. Um, and of course, if you're working in an embedded environment like I do, then you could be able to run your unit tests on the target device or at least on a simulated device so that if there are bits and pieces of your code, for example, implemented in assembly, you can also test those. Uh, but it's also a bit limited in, in some ways. I already told about the limitations that the language offers you, so you can only use C constructs, which are not as powerful as Python constructs, for example. You need to write much more code than you could in a higher level language. But you're also limited by what uh, the framework has to offer you. And if you look up unit testing frameworks for C code, there are tons of frameworks out there, but most of them are very basic. They don't offer advanced features that you might be used to when you look at unit testing frameworks that are offered, for example, for Python code. So there are a few frameworks only that offer mocking, for example. And in the end, you're also limited by what the ecosystem has to offer. We, for example, we would like to test some cryptographic algorithms in our implementations. And of course, you can call into OpenSSL to verify some, some calculation but it's not really that easy and it might be nicer to do that in Python. Now, maybe we can do better than that and I've prepared a few, a few examples to show you how unit testing C code with Python would look like. So the first example is the most basic thing I could think of got a single function in our C code that just adds two integers and returns the result. So this is the header file, the public interface that we want to unit test. And this then is the implementation of that function. It just adds the numbers and returns the value. And if you write a unit test for that, it could look like this. So as usual with Python unit tests, uh, you've got a test case class as a container for all your test cases. The single function in there then is your test case. We've only got one here. And it's rather simple. It loads in the source code that I've shown you before, creates a module out of that, and then has an object on which it call, can call the functions that is defined in the module. This function returns the result, and we can assert that the result is really correct. Now you don't see any C code in here and no constructs that really do anything with, with the C code from before. The only mentioning uh, thing that you see is the, the name of the module, the parameter for the load function, um, 
And this is where all the magic happens. So let's look into that. The load function here um, consists of three steps. First, it loads the source code from the module, so it opens the C file, it opens the header file, and reads out the source code. And then it uses CFFI to build a Python module out of that source, out of that source code. There are three calls that you need to make on the CFFI object for that. On the first call, the CDEF call, will tell CFFI what interface it has to export to our Python code. So we pass in the header file contents that defines the public interface. We want to test that, so CFFI needs to generate uh, the interface for us. And then with the second call, we need to tell CFFI about the implementation of the function. So we pass in the source code here. And the last step then is for CFFI to actually build the module that we want to have. So it runs a C compiler in the background, builds the module, and in the end, as the last step, we can import that module and return it to our test case. And that's really all you need to run this example that I've shown you before. Now I've got three more examples that all build on this implementation, so I'd like to quickly ask whether there are any questions for this example already, so that you can better understand uh, the following examples. You mean if you had more than one source file? Yeah, because you know, in that, uh, it works now. Yeah, because uh, if uh, in this uh, example source file uh, I have some sort of includes and dependencies to other source files, and how do I cope with that? I have to compile them also and link them somehow, or how, how does it work? Uh, yeah, I've got some more complex examples with multiple files and with external dependencies, and we'll show that later. Okay, any more questions? Otherwise, I'll continue with the second example. And the second example is still rather basic. We've got, again, a single function that you can call multiple times. It will just add up all the parameters that you pass into it and return the current sum. This is its interface, and this, again, the implementation. So now we've got a global variable that we use to sum up everything. The function just adds to it and returns the current value. And the unit tests now look like this. To make matters a bit more interesting, I've implemented now three unit tests, not only one. And so that I do not have to repeat this load call in every test case again, I use the setup method. This gets executed before each test case is run. It will load the module for the test case. And then the test case can access the module just as before. It can call the function there, assert that the results are correct. But if I were to run this test case with the load function that I've shown you before, it wouldn't work. And why wouldn't it work? Well, in the source code, there's this global variable there. And the load function that we had before, it just imported the module at the end. And if you know a bit about how importing works in Python, those imports are cached. So if there are multiple test cases running, the first one will actually import the module, initialize the global variable. All the other test cases will just, re just get the cached import back, and it won't be initialized again. So the assumption of the test cases that the sum always starts with zero, uh, doesn't hold here, and so the test cases would fail. Now, there are several solutions to this. Um, I'm just going to show you the, the simplest one, and that looks like this. The load function is still the same, just the first line with the comment has changed or got added, uh, where I generate a random name for the module. So this avoids all caching by importing essentially a new module every time this function is called, which might not be the most a uh, performance solution, and it will also use more memory, but it avoids nicely all the problems that you could otherwise have with caching old data. Um, for this, I use the, the UID module, which just generates a random unique ID and appends that to the file name, which is then used as, as the module name. All the other code in here is the same as before, so each test case can still load the module and gets a fresh copy every time. You could also implement that uh, in a different way and when, you have, when you've imported the module, just reinitialize it every time, but that would, make, it would take more code, so I don't show it here. Okay, then example number three. And here we are getting to multiple files now. Since all the other examples so far were very basic with just a single C file and a single header file, 
Uh, now we take at least a second header file, and we want to do some mathematics with complex numbers, so we define our own structure for that. That has just two fields for the, the two parts of a complex number, for the real part and the imaginary part, and we have that in one header file. And then we also want to implement a function that uses this type. So again, we use the example of addition, adding two complex numbers and returning the result. And we can implement it like this. We just add both parts together and return the result at the end. Now the test case for this, again, doesn't really need to know much about the C code. We load the module as before. And uh, you don't even have to deal with the complex type that the, the header file declared somewhere. When you want to call the add function, you just pass in the lists here, and CFFI will automatically generate structures for that so that the C code is happy and gets the correct results. And also the, the result of this function call is a nice Python object where you can access the parts of the structure with normal names and can assert that all these uh, results are correct. But again, for this example to work, we can't use the, the previous implementation of the load function because in the previous implementation, it just looked at the source file and the header file of the module that we want to test. It doesn't really know about the other header file that we also need. Now, if you remember the source code, you could say, yeah, well, the, the other header file got included into the module's header file, so it should be present there. But unfortunately, CFFI cannot deal with these include statements. So what we need to do is we need to run some kind of preprocessor, like the C preprocessor over the source code, so that there are no more include statements in there, no other directive that CFFI doesn't understand. Otherwise, it would throw an error. And this is done with this preprocess call in here. Again, there are multiple ways you could implement that. Uh, I've chosen to just run the GCC preprocessor over the source code and get back the results. So at the end, I've got one large string that contains the contents of both header files, and CFFI is happy with that. Now, for the last example, um, it gets even a bit more complex because now we, we have some external dependencies. Uh, in this case, you can imagine you're, uh, you want to program a microcontroller, and maybe the vendor of the microcontroller provides you with a nice library like this here, where you can uh, read GPIOs using simple function calls, and the vendor has chosen to implement different functions for each GPIO that you can access. So he provides you with a library that has this interface here. But maybe in your code, you'd rather like to use this interface. You only want a single function call and a parameter to select the GPIO that you're interested in. Now, you can implement that in your own code. You just look at the parameter, call the appropriate function, and if you get a parameter that you cannot deal with, you return some kind of error code. And now, this is the code that we want to cover with our unit test. We don't want to test the vendor's library, so we don't want to use the, the read GPIO 0 or 1 calls here. We probably even couldn't use them in the unit test because they might access some registers of the microcontroller that aren't there in our test environment. So we somehow need to replace those calls uh, with our mock functions so that we can run a test case that knows what the GPIO values are. Um, the test case for that looks like this. Um, the first change that you'll notice to the previous implementations is that the load function now returns two values, not only the module as before, but also an FFI object that's part of CFFI's interface, and we use that in the first test case to replace the C function that we don't want to use with a Python implementation. So we define a function that has the same name as the C function we want to replace, and we tell CFFI, hey, when this C function gets called, please use this Python implementation instead. Don't use a C implementation that you might find somewhere. And so the, the uh, Python implementation just can return a fixed value, then the test case can call the function that we want to test with the correct parameter and see that the value that, it, that it defined before is returned in the end. And the second test case for the GPIO number one, it does the same thing, but using a different construct. So in this case, uh, we don't want to really define a function. 
but we want to use a mock, a mock object like you might be used to from the unit test library. And you can do just the same with it. You configure your mock object to return a value when it's called and then tell CFFI, hey, this is not a function, but it's just something else that you can call. Use that in place of the C function. And then the test case again works, can call this function, and at the end you can also use the uh, assert methods that are provided by the metric mock function. And in this case, again, we need to modify the load functionality. This is, again, for comparison, the old implementation. And we need to add some more code to that for this example to work. Um, there's three changes here, all again marked with a comment. The first change is that it's not sufficient anymore to just process the header file for the module, but we actually need to process all the header files that are included in this module. So it just uses a regular expression to collect all the include statements, then runs that through a preprocessor and as a result, gets one large string again that contains all the include statements, all the, all the contents of the include files of our module. And the main work then is done in the next two lines uh, where we need to tell CFFI which functions we want to replace with Python code and which functions are implemented in our C code. So the first line just goes through the source code and looks for all the function definitions so that we know which functions are implemented by our source code. And the second line then goes through all the includes that we have, looks for all the function declarations in there, and whenever it finds a function that is not implemented in the source code, it will tell CFFI, hey, please insert a Python implementation in here that, that we can replace later. Uh, the functionality is all there in CFFI. We just need to prefix the function declarations with this extern Python plus C um, statement, then CFFI will know, okay, I need to generate some code for that. And this will already make the compiler happy. It will find a reference for this function so it can call it, and we can later replace it with Python code. And in the end, the last change is, as I said before, that we now need to return this FFI object also from the load function so that the test cases can tell CFFI about the, the implementations that it wanted to use. Now I'll show you in a bit more detail how this step in the middle works where we um, analyze the source code to find the function definitions. And this is based on PyC parser and this is the first part that collects all the function definitions. So PyC parser will analyze your source code and will build an abstract, abstract syntax tree out of it so you can later walk this tree with the class that's already provided and whenever you hit a function definition this visit function here is called. It will get the node out of the tree and can just ask this node, okay, what is the name of the function? It will add this to a list. And so in the end, once it has walked through the whole tree, you've got a list of all the, the functions that are implemented in the source code, of all the names of the functions there. And this is then used in the second part, again, based on, on the PyC part of the module, um, where we actually parse all the include contents into an abstract syntax tree and then tell PyC parser to regenerate the corresponding C code from that so that we can modify some bits of that. And PyC parser already has support to regenerate code from the tree and we just hook into that and whenever we see a declaration for a function, this is then again the visit function for declarations. We look at the declaration there and see whether it's a function declaration and if it is, and the name for this declaration is not in the list of functions that we found in the source code, then we'll just prefix it with the extern Python plus C statement so that when CFFI again parses the source code, it will know what to do with these functions. Okay, this was the last example that I wanted to show you. So to sum up, um, I want to talk quickly about some of the drawbacks that this approach might have if you're used to other approaches. And one of the, the main drawbacks is probably that if you use this code, as I've shown it to you, if your C code does something bad and tries to access a null pointer, for example, then it will also crash the test process because the code actually runs in the same process. There are no boundaries between it. So when your C code destroys something, your test will crash. You won't get any nice error reports, and you might not like that. So one solution to that problem would be to run each test case in a separate process. 
and have one main process collect all the results. Then if one test crashes, it just crashes the single test case. The main process can still report on the errors and all your other test cases will continue to run. This might add a little overhead, of course, because now you have multiple uh, processes running that uh, yeah, need, need some more computing time, but at the, same point, at the same time, you can also run your tests in parallel. So if you've got multiple cores, it might actually be faster in the end than running everything in, in serial. And another big problem might be that debugging your test cases gets harder now because you've got a Python process that calls some C functions that again might call some Python functions and where really do you debug that? You can attach a debugger to your Python test cases, but that won't help you much once you enter C land. You won't see what, what the C code does there, or you can attach a C level debugger so that you can see what your test or what your implementation does, but then you have to deal with all the, the C calls that, that are done by the Python interpreter internally and that you need to skip somehow. So it would be nice, of course, to have some maybe better integrated solution here, some combination of two debuggers, for, one for the Python side, one for the C side, that smoothly hand over control once you uh, enter the, the other part. Or one could also argue that since we are talking about unit tests here, if you really need to debug your unit tests, maybe you could also think about simplifying your code, simplifying your unit tests or even the implementation so uh, that you don't need to debug them in order to find a problem, but so that you've got unit tests that really can tell you where the problem is when something breaks. Um, but to end on a positive note, if you're going to remember something from this talk, I'd like, to, I'd like you to remember that writing the test cases is really simple, and no matter how complex your C code looks like, as you've seen all the examples that I've shown you, the test cases look pretty much the same, because all the complexity that you need to care about is hidden inside CFFI and the wrapper code that I've shown you here. As a test case author, you don't really need to deal with that. You just can concentrate on writing your test cases, and you need to solve the hard parts only once, have it in a generic part of the code, and never look at that again as long as it works. So thank you for your attention. If yeah, we have any questions? And can you run tests from C, uh, from Python on a compiled uh, library, for example, like from a built binary code? Can you import that in CFFI? Yeah, that is one of the, the main use cases actually for CFFI, that you can interface from Python to existing libraries so that you can build a nice Python interface for, for libraries that already exist without needing to reinvent them. So that's, of course, possible. This approach was more meant to test the source code so it passes in the source code, not a library, but of course you can also tell it here, use the existing library. And could, you could probably also do, do this, uh, could you do this trick with mocking? Or like uh, you know, put uh, uh, alternative function or mm, function definitions in a loaded shared object or something like that? Do you think that this is possible? Well, that depends. If the function that you want to mock is not part of the library, but would be part of another library, and you don't link against that library, then it should be possible, because then you have to uh, insert your own implementation of that function anyway for it to compile. But if you want to mock a function that's part of the library that you, you want to test, and it's implemented in there, you can't really replace it, because it's part of the same binary, and the code will just call the function in there. You can't really take it out and insert another implementation there. Okay, so you cannot switch out the binary uh, calls, okay. <laughs> if uh, I would refactor my C code, say, um, change the name of the fun a function as a signature, and forgot to adapt my test, how easy it is, you know, to spot the mismatch. Do I get the proper error message, or does it just crash? No CFFI will tell you if you want to call a function that doesn't exist, that, well, there's no, no such attribute on the module. You'll get the usual error codes for that. 
If you change the type, it probably depends a bit on how compatible the old type is to the new type. If you maybe change an int to a float or something like that, you might even need, not need to, to adapt your test cases. Even if you pass in an int, CFFI will just convert that to, to a float value then for your uh, call. But if I would uh, use a different struct name or so, it would detect that. Yeah, or the order you, of the... Again, if you change the names so that they're not compatible, you, you uh, get an error message. If you have, on the other hand, a structure that's completely different, a completely different name, but has the same, uh, the same types in there, then you probably won't notice. If you change the, the complex number structure, for example, and just uh, switch the order of the fields, you won't notice that when you pass in the parameters. You will only notice that then when you test for the, for the assertions in the end. No more questions? Yes? Can the CFFI module can be also used for the C++ code? For what, please? C++. For C++, uh, I think it's, it's not uh, completely supported now, but uh, there's the main CFFI developer, Armin, in, in one of the four roles. Ah. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> right. you can ask him about new features. <laughs> <laughs> Short answer is no. Okay, thank you for your attention and thank you, Alexander, again.